when a chemical engineer examines a problem or is considering the design of some kind of process, it pays dividends to fundamentally understand the chemistry that is involved in the chemical reactions and how we can use them to our advantage to significantly reduce costs later downstream in our separations. And to turn back to an example in which we were discussing how we are extracting methane gas from lake water in Africa to supply electricity and cooking fuel for local residents, uh, we assumed that we are not going to bound carbon dioxide uh, in the lake water and it will be an effluent in our gas uh, exiting our disengagement tank here. And in that situation, what we found was uh, if we tried altering the pressure of our tank, I'll denote it PT, we want to have very high pressure in our tank in that situation when carbon dioxide was in our effluent uh, to get uh, the highest recovery of methane from the lake water to help us later on downstream in our reactors. But what we'll find is in the example that I'm about to go through, if we can turn to chemistry and chemically bind carbon dioxide, uh, we're going to have completely different characteristics and our design will essentially make a 180 in terms of what our goals are. And so it is common knowledge that carbon dioxide will form uh, carbonic acid when in water. It's also referred to as uh, bicarbonate. Uh, and so when uh, water is deprotonated, uh, it can act as a, the hydroxide ions can act as a nucleophile and attack the carbon dioxide. Um, it, it essentially makes the water acidic when carbon dioxide uh, is dissolved in it. Um, and what we find Essentially, if I was to write this out a little bit clearer for people, hopefully if uh, we don't want to look at arrow pushing mechanisms, but there's no harm in that. Um, we get HCO3 2 minus, which is bicarbonate plus an H plus. Um, and this reaction generally shifts to the left most of the time, especially if we're going to have carbon dioxide exiting our system in the effluent. But if we make our solution basic, if we supply hydroxide ions to our solution in our disengagement vessel, what will happen is these hydroxide ions will deprotonate the bicarbonate to form carbonate. And carbonate will uh, resemble this. So we'll have uh, some kind of, one second. Uh, a, a molecule that looks like this, it's going to have a, a total charge of minus two. And um, if we supply calcium ions to our solution, or the ions are probably floating around, the calcium ions will bind or form an ionic bond with the carbonate, and we get uh, calcium carbonate. And the nice thing about calcium carbonate, so if we have an OH come in here uh, and do its work, what we get out is calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate is a solid. And so the calcium carbonate precipitates out of our solution. And so that means that the carbon dioxide that we had to worry about running expensive compressors to get rid of is no longer a problem for us as a chemical engineer. And this is very nice, uh, and it, uh, but we are going to now have to redesign our uh, chemical process design. And so in the case when uh, we have uh, carbon dioxide precipitating out of the lake water, the only gas that exists in our solution because uh, the uh, carbon dioxide is now in the form of the calcium carbonate 
methane is all that exists. Methane is CH4, is the only component in the gas phase. Now, so what this means is if we wanted to determine what the total pressure of our system is inside of our disengagement vessel, uh, P total is just going to be one component, the partial pressure of methane. Because YCH4 is equal to 1. And because YCH4 is equal to 1, what that means is that we can say that the concentration of methane that exists in the liquid phase is equivalent to the total pressure of our gas phase divided by Henry's constant HCH4. And this is something we can derive from uh, given equilibrium data. And another side note here, we're assuming we reach, <laughs> sorry, equilibrium. And so uh, this sometimes might not be the best assumption to make, but uh, you will a priori have understood this in lab, uh, whether or not you can safely make this assumption that there is sufficient time, a residence time inside of your disengagement vessel to reach equilibrium. But this is a key finding here um, from our intuition and analysis that uh, we found what the concentration of methane now is in the water as a function of the pressure in the tank. Uh, and this is in the lake water. Now, to carry on with this uh, design problem, if we want to know what the recovery is, uh, let's take a look at it from a different angle. And so what I'm going to do is look at the fraction not recovered in the gas phase. And this is essentially the, the fraction um, of methane that still exists in the liquid. So intuitively, I will call this the mole of methane still, sorry, still in liquid divided by the mole of methane uh, at 350 meters in the lake when we only had one phase, which was the liquid phase. Uh, there's no gas phase yet because the hydrostatic pressure was too much. And this is equal to, we're going to have concentration of methane in the liquid phase times volume of the liquid phase. We're going to divide this by concentration of methane in the liquid phase at 350 meters, which I denote with that not symbol, times volume of the liquid phase. And you'll note how, because volume is incompressible, we can pull out the volume from our uh, definition of moles of methane. Uh, and so with that, we arrive at this relationship here. And so if we wanted to now define what recovery is, recovery is equal to one minus the fraction not recovered. And what we're going to see here, before I look at recovery, uh, let me just get rid of this. What we see here is that the fraction not recovered is proportional to the concentration of methane that exists in the liquid phase. And this should make intuitive sense. But what did we find right here about the pressure uh, where we are seeing the concentration of methane that exists in your liquid phase is proportional to the pressure, directly proportional to the pressure of your disengagement vessel. or disengagement tank. And so what this means to a chemical engineer is that because we want to maximize the fraction recovered, we're going to want to 
operate the disengagement vessel at low pressures and this should make uh, this is completely opposite to what we found when we performed the other calculation in which we saw that we want to have a high pressure in our tank so um, understanding the chemistry that is going on as well as the extent that this chemistry is going on plays an enormously important role in how a chemical engineer is going to design a process because what we just saw here is we can have two separate uh, pressures that we want to operate and so if we don't fundamentally understand the chemistry that's going on we are going to potentially make a catastrophic mistake and have very poor yield um, and a competitor can come along and do it a lot more cheaply so uh, this is just kind of food for thought for people interested in chemical design um, process design and I hope you guys find it thought-provoking <laughs> uh, let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching